Upside Down and Inside Out. When I first read that as the theme for this month's storytelling, I thought it was kind of whimsical, you know, like you might tell a story about leprechauns or something silly, and I could have gone in that direction, but I've had my own life turned upside down and inside out, and honestly, it was anything but. But I learned a very important lesson from this experience, and it's, it's one I'd like to share with you, and this is a deeply personal story. So let me backtrack a bit. I was chatting with a friend of mine who said that he saw two people chatting amiably that you just wouldn't expect to be so comfortable with each other. You wouldn't expect them to be friends. One of them was this little old lady, and she was this church lady, you know, with the little dress and the pocketbook, and you could just, you could just read her that she went to church every week and had grandchildren and baked cookies and probably knit, and going to church, that's what got her out of the house. And the person that she was chatting with was this very large, rather shabbily dressed, tatted up, scary looking biker. And how on earth are these two friends? Now, most of us, we tend to live in our boxes and the walls of our boxes are very clearly defined. Now, your box might be your faith. You know, you like being with and praying with like-minded people, okay, or your ethnicity, you know. Um, it's not that you have anything against those people, but you don't want them in your box, and if you were in their box, you would feel like an outsider. That's perfectly natural. Maybe it's your social status. Are you a member of the club? Are you working class? Are you middle class? With whom do you rub elbows? Well, who are your people? Where are you comfortable? Now, some of us will actually make a point of venturing outside of our boxes. We'll make a point of having friends who are different from ourselves. Or we'll try a different kind of restaurant, a different kind of flavors that maybe we've never experienced before. Or the greatest extreme is we'll actually do a foreign exchange program. We will go to another country and be strangers in that country and to that language and we will learn that language and we will learn that culture and you know and that broadens the boundaries of our box nowadays a very defining box is politics we we just can't even have a conversation with those people because those people are just nuts and so we just, we, we like to talk to our people because our people make sense to us. So this little church lady and this biker chatting as friends, that relationship didn't make sense until you understand that they were in the waiting room of an oncology office. They were both cancer Patience. What cancer does is it takes you out of your box and it drops you in the cancer box. And it takes from all of the other boxes and it drops them together in the cancer box. And once you are in that box, all you know is that you want out of that box and you want everyone who is in there with you out of that box. I have been in the cancer box. I was not the patient. My darling wife of blessed memory, she had breast cancer and she was the patient and I was her caregiver. And, you know, having the shadow of death hanging over us like that, Coming from a non-religious, secular background, she really started to think, what comes next? 
what happens to us after this life. And so she would ask the nurses and therapists and whomever what they thought. And so one nurse, very sweet lady, was a born-again Christian, and she was praying for my wife. And another was Vietnamese, and she was a Buddhist, and another was Muslim. And they all had their ideas and their faith and, and what worked for them. Um, one nurse, the Buddhist Mai, she was Vietnamese, and we were washing Jackie's hair. I was helping Mai to wash Jackie's hair, and Jackie just got overwhelmed and she started crying and she said I love you Mai I really do and Mai said oh no sweetie no you don't cry come on you are my sunshine my only sunshine I will love Mai forever she was so cute she was so sweet I come from a religious background and I was in that chapel every day with my prayer shawl and my tefillin and my prayer book and just praying so fervently that we get through this. But I found myself not caring how other people pray or even if they pray. All I really cared about was how they treated my wife. Did they treat my wife with compassion. And if they did that, God bless them. Now another incident part of this story is we were waiting for a chemo treatment and in the waiting room they have these very large armchairs with foot rests and they have these blankets that sit in these warming ovens because when you're in chemo you lose a lot of weight, so your body loses a lot of its natural insulation, and it's very hard to keep warm. So they keep these blankets and they keep these comfy chairs because chemo leaves you very weak. A young man came out, and, and he was so weak. His, his skin was sallow, which meant that he was in liver failure. I'd be very surprised to learn that he had survived. I, I seriously doubt that he did, but he was so weak, he was struggling to get the blanket over his own feet. And so seeing his struggle, I just, I jumped up and I wrapped the blanket over his feet and I, and I tucked them on, under his legs. And he said, oh, thank you, sir, thank you, thank you. He was Arabic and I think thank you was about all the English he knew. And I just touched his arm and I looked in his eyes and I said, God bless you. Now, with him as this Muslim from Arabia and me as an American Jew, a religious, very opinionated American Jew, had we met under other circumstances we might have gotten to an argument about Middle East politics. But in that moment, in that cancer ward, that was not a place for politics or arguments of any kind. That was just a place for compassion and healing. My wife didn't make it. Now, I am still a Jew. My prayers are the Jewish prayers. But I've had to rethink a few things. I, I can't be one of those people who says everything happens for a reason. I really think the reason is what we give to the tragedies of our lives. Now, maybe your reason is that you join a cause, you join the march to stop a disease, or if you are one of the parents from Sandy Hook, you are trying to ban assault weapons because that is what took your loved one. You give it that reason. 
or maybe you just give up and you climb into a bottle. But whoever you are, whatever your choices, whatever your faith, I would ask you this. Are the choices you're making, is the way that you treat people, does that make them look at you and say, God bless you? Because if your faith isn't doing that, then really, what good is it at all? Amen.